Live from our newsroom, it's the Hard Times Podcast. With Bill Conway and Matt Sanko. You know, I feel like I've been a part of a lot of really niche subcultural communities, um, which, you know, you can be very passionate about, but then all of a sudden you're just outside the bounds of the thought process of the group or whatever, and all of a sudden you're no lo- you can no longer hang out or whatever. Tell me if you had any experiences like that and, and what they might have been about. Sure. I mean, that was like the story of my life up until a mm-hmm. certain point. And uh, I think uh, – I think actually I heard Brendan Kelly from the Lawrence Arms say it best once when he said that I've flipped over every table I've sat down at. And mm. I was like, <laughs> I like that, Brendan. <laughs> I'll keep fucking doing that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, that it, for a long time there, it was like every move against me made, we alienated the previous scene that we were a part, or that we were a part of. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I really felt like we kind of came from nowhere and we weren't originally a part of any scene because against Mm -hmm. me was a band that started off in Naples, Florida. There was no punk scene in Naples, Florida. Me and my friends were the Which is the most beautiful Naples in the the world, right? There's, uh, (laughs) I don't think there's another Naples that compares. Well, I, you know, to be honest, I grew up in Naples, Italy. I moved from oh. Naples, Italy to Naples, <laughs> Florida. Uh, so I, while Naples, Italy is far more uh, polluted, uh, I still think it's a beautiful place. And I would rather live in Naples, Italy than I'd live in Naples, Florida. But circumstance did bring me to Naples, Florida. And there wasn't a punk scene there. So we kind of had to invent our own. This being definitely pre-internet days where, um, you know, it was, it was hard to find out about bands, especially in South Florida, because most bands didn't tour there. Uh, Because if you tour to the South of Florida, there's only one direction you can go. You got to turn right back around and head north up the state. So, you know, we started off there, started out doing our own thing, and eventually moved to Gainesville. But we were always kind of apart from everything that was happening in Gainesville, because, you know, like, we, we were younger, uh, we were this weird band that played with acoustic guitars and a drummer on pickle buckets with no cymbals, and we were really a part of the activist scene. Like, their first shows in Gainesville, we would always play at this place called the Civic Media Center, which is a non-profit, non-corporate press, volunteer-run, lending library, activist meeting space. So we very much became a band. It's a very long that, way to say venue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, it's a descriptive way to say it's a library, okay. really, is what right. it is. It's, it's a library. It, um, but they do shows, too. And, um, and we would play there. I eventually got a position where I was booking shows there, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we weren't welcome, really, playing at any of the traditional venues in, in, in Gainesville. First of all, because we weren't even 21, you know, so... Uh, we couldn't play in any of the bars or anything like that. And then people thought we were weird. But eventually, we got accepted into the Gainesville scene, which is the No Idea record scene. And even then, when we like got accepted into what was the real music scene in Gainesville, we are immediately alienated from the activist scene in Gainesville. And the mm-hmm. people who centered around the Civic Media Center thought we kind of sold out them by starting you know, to put out records with No Idea. And then from No Idea... You know, we released our first record, Reinventing Axl Rose, and that got really popular beyond anybody's expectations. And we got the opportunity to do a record with Fat Records. So we wanted to do that, which immediately alienated us from the No Idea record scene and the Gainesville scene. And we were already alienated from the the activist scene, but it made the activist scene even more pissed off because... I don't know if it's like an East Coast, West Coast thing or whatever with, with uh, Fat Records, but uh, you know, p- people didn't understand why we would want to work with Fat Records. But for me, it was like, hey, like I don't know, my, my second show I ever went to was No Effects. Like, I grew up listening to Fat Records bands. I have no shame in admitting that. You know? um, so we were super excited. But the opportunity to, be on, to work with Fat Records... Uh, brought bigger tours then too so the band just kept growing and like every step along the way it it alienated from people people from us it it felt like for every three fans we gained we lost two because of a choice we made 
whether that was, you know, people were pissed off we toured with anti-flag. People were pissed off that we were touring with anti-flag because it was a package tour, because there was like I'm a five I'm still band pissed bill. off you toured with anti-flag. <laughs> I'm still that's... pissed off about it too, but that's a separate <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, so like, you know, people were pissed off about that. Then, then uh, after our first record on Fat Records, like we got serious major label interest and started getting courted by major labels. At first, I saw that as an opportunity to make fun of them, and I, you know, I, I grew up watching the great rock and roll swindle, and I was like, this is our opportunity to do our, our own great rock and roll swindle. And we, like, you know, we filmed it, we, we uh, made a, a documentary called We're Never Going Home that Fat Records put out, um, where we basically were courted by the labels, and then at the end we said, no, fuck you, and stayed with Fat Records. Mm-hmm. And you know, that was the truth, that's what we genuinely did. So we did our next record with Fat Records, Searching for a Form of Clarity. And then after that, the major label interest was still there. And, you know, we had whatever experiences we had with Searching that after which I was like, you know what? I want to take this opportunity. I just want to see what happens. And, of course, then having made a a documentary and a DVD where the end is us not signing to a major label for us (laughs) to then turn around and sign to a major label. There we go. We alienated fucking everybody again and all the people... The DVD consumers are pissed now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And Fat Records fans were pissed. So the No Idea Records fans are pissed. The original, like, Planet X punk scene fans are pissed. The, you know, like, everyone just continually was pissed off at us. And then we found ourselves in a world of the major label world where we just, we didn't really fit in there. And, you know, um, we did not have the, the top 10 number one hit single, which is really what you need in order to survive in that world. You know, you either need to sell a million records or, or, or you're fucked. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and we did two records with Sire, uh, got dropped, and then, um, then I came out, and then the rest is history, right? When you said people were pissed along the way, um, was there any notable things um, that happened? So, like, were people just pissed and you'd hear that people were pissed? Or did the uh, library where you first started playing shows say that you were no longer welcome to rent books or anything like that? <laughs> uh, there was kind of a campaign similar to that, yeah, being no longer welcome to play in those spaces, you know? Uh, uh, whether that was even like, uh, you know, we, we'd play shows at Gilman whenever we would tour through Oakland. And then once we signed to a major label, you're no longer welcome to play at Gilman. Uh, but there were there were physical op- alterations. I can probably get you a show at Gilman. Do you want to play Gilman again? <laughs> Thank you. I would fucking love to play Gilman again. Absolutely. Let's, let's I it. love Gilman. Um, 100%. But, um, I mean, I'd love to play any show right now, but yes, yeah. yes, Gilman specifically. Uh, You'd play with but, Anti-Flag right now if you could. I would. I would. I would. I, although, I, I mean that non-jokingly. Uh, I have nothing but respect for them now. And uh, would, um, I, I, I genuinely acknowledge I was a total asshole when I was younger to them. I apologize. Okay, well, we don't know what you're talking about, so what's, you're going to have to fill us in at some point. Or well, what is this? Like, look, the thing that happened between Anti-Flag. Well, this, well no, you know, you know be, being in this situation, where there was this continual fallout and um you know people continually calling you a sellout or whatever like i wasn't secure i was young you know so i I was like insecure and would react in in certain ways and that was always like punching up you know so if you're on tour with this punk band that's bigger than your punk band and you're the punk band that's getting all the flack for being a sellout well then you direct it at the headliner um, and you do childish pranks, like put peanut butter on their door handle or hide frozen pig's feet in their gym bags or, or you know, piss in their Gatorade, whatever. Um, frozen pig feet? Where do you even get your hands on those? That's, that's a bizarre prank. We were coming from the south to meet up with the tourists. So, yeah. so, uh, Gainesville's lousy with frozen pig's feet. I mean, the, the, you know, genuinely the thing I feel worse about with the – or really bad about with that frozen pig foot incident is that it ended up in Chris Head's bag. And Chris okay, wait, you, like, you, put the, you put the frozen pig feet into the bag? I'm not admitting guilt in this podcast, right? But, um, I was a party to it, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so it, it, did it end up in a vegan's bag? Is that what happened? I, yeah, I think it did. And also the nicest member of Anti-Flag, Chris Head, you know? Um, <laughs> you get, you know? <laughs> but so anyways, you know, like, uh, I, d- I didn't know ha- how to handle the pressure I was under. And, and you know, there were physical altercations where, I mean, there was a, a columnist named Bill Florio who wrote for Maximum Rock and Roll, who wrote this long column uh, advising people to dump bleach on our merch at shows and to sh- stop our That's shows nice. at all costs. 
This was when we were still on fat records uh, because we were a part of package tours. Just because we were a part of package tours. Oh, God, um, that's annoying. <laughs> I'm getting yeah. get mad just hearing about this. <laughs> uh, but, but there you know, would be people at shows physically, like, uh, you, know that, you know the band The Ladderman. We, we, played uh-huh. in, um, we played in Long Island. This is at a, a VFW hall show set up by a 16-year-old fan. It was $8 to get in. And members of the Ladderman were so pissed because we were on fat records that they showed up. And during the show, they're like physically reaching out and putting their hands on my guitar neck to try to stop us from playing. Like, like getting up in your face like they want to fight you, you know? Mm-hmm. And you're just like all these situations where you're like, what, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and, and then also like feeling like so turned off by it that, it, you know, my reaction at the time was like, fuck you, fuck punk if this was what punk is. This was never mm-hmm. what I thought it was, so fuck you, take your version mm-hmm. of it, get the fuck out of here. And it only further like alienated me and wanted me to um, then you know, do the major label. And just because I, I felt like I, I don't belong in any of these places. you know. 